Welcome to another episode of the Balancing Hormones Naturally podcast, where we offer actions and steps you can take today to start balancing your hormones naturally. This is your podcast host, Leah Brueggemann. I am a functional diagnostic nutritional practitioner. I am honored and excited to be your guide on your journey to better understanding your hormonal health and how it affects your everyday life. Hey ladies, welcome back to another episode of the Balancing Hormones Naturally podcast. We have another awesome guest here. So this is Jen Trepic, and she is an optimal health coach, podcaster, and a business consultant. And I always like, sorry, I know you guys give me these beautiful bios, but like I just do my own version of them. A hundred percent. Make it yours. Um, so she's the podcast host of salad with a side of fries. And that's just the best name I've ever heard of a podcast because what you are and what you talk about is like, how do I like live my life, but also feel good, you know? And I think that in the health space, people tend to be like, you can never eat a fry or you always have to eat salads. And I'm just like, what if you don't digest salads? Like what? do you not fit into the health space? So I love that you are entering in this little happy medium. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Like what got you started here? Yeah. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. I'm excited for us to chat. Um, so I like so many of us in the space. So I'm a health coach. I came to this through, I call it a saga. I feel okay. like the word journey like doesn't do it justice of what yeah. it like I joke that I grew up the skinny one in a family of dieters. Okay. And I was a dancer growing up so I was more f- aware of my body than most people active. I think. Yeah, very active but also like part of it was the awareness of like where my body is in space and how I move. And so when I started to gain weight, like it was between high school and college. So I stopped dancing, right? (laughs) So many of us, (laughs) it was like everything changed, you know? And so I started to gain weight and I was like, hyper aware of it and extra uncomfortable because of being a dancer Mm -hmm. and recognizing like how I was moving differently, Mm -hmm. you know, things like that. Yeah. Um, and so I was like, okay, well, I know what to do because I watched my family do this my whole life, right? You go on this diet and then you go on that diet and the scale is going to go up and down. It was like, a roller coaster, merry-go-round, whatever you yeah. want to call it. I did it. And I thought that's what was, that was the plan, <laughs> you know? And yeah. I feel like I, there isn't a diet out there that I haven't done. My family hasn't done, or we don't know somebody who's done it. Mm-hmm. And in that process, I ended up learning about um, a curriculum that I now have base my program on, which is really all about understanding. I mean, I call it the nutrition education we're all supposed to know and no one ever taught us. It's right. like, how does food impact our body? How does our body process food? And then focusing more on how to eat rather than what to eat. Mm-hmm. And it completely changed my life. Like the only thing that's allowed me to say I've kicked my food issues. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it turned these food decisions from being emotional, mm-hmm. right? Like, why do I suck? Why can't I just choose this thing? Why is, you know, that so appealing to me? Why can't I just say no to something that was much more intellectual? It was like, I understood why that thing was appealing, what mm-hmm. that meant my body was telling me. And it was like yeah. the dark cloud dissipated, like the weight was lifted And I set out on a mission to pay it forward and help people help themselves with this information. So like I want to, it was late 2007. I started with working, working with clients on side (laughs) of my full-time job. And now here we are. Yeah. Years later. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. We'll, we'll just, yeah. (laughs) Ignore that part. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, it's all good. Yeah. I, I'm almost 40. Nobody would know. No, actually, I wouldn't. I thought you were <laughs> my age. So we'll pull well, with that. But I also say, P.S., we all have to start telling everybody how old we are because this is what 40 looks like now. Mm-hmm. You know, this is like some of my friends who are older. I'm like, no, tell people how old you are. That's what 50 looks like. That's what 60 looks like. That's what 70 looks like. It's not what I feel like we thought 70 looked like when we were kids. This is true. I was actually talking to my husband about that. And I was like, oh my gosh, when, uh, I don't know. I was like, when Landon graduates, this is how old I'm going to be. And he's like, Leah, that's not old. (laughs) Like you can still like, (laughs) you can still go hiking and traveling. And I'm like, I can. (laughs) Right. I know. (laughs) So yeah, definitely a mental switch there, especially when you take care of yourself. Um, Exactly. I, so, okay. I just want to like you have heard of the almond mom right please tell me you've heard of the almond mom. Yes, okay. yes so that's what I feel like our generation grew up with and I I think a lot of them still haven't like even come to grips with the fact maybe that they are an almond mom <laughs> because <laughs> whenever I will have um women that are postmenopausal that I will start to work with one of the hardest things is to get them to eat food they yes. will literally just be like, I had a fiber drink, Leah. I don't need to eat. And I'm like, yes, you do. But <laughs> that is just that chronic diet culture. Like our parents yep. g- grew up during the low fat, you know, fat was evil. So then we put sugar yep. in everything, sugar and chemicals. And then, you know, fat was really, really good. And now we hate carbs. Yeah. Um, I'm waiting. I'm trying it's to like, like low carb, no carb, low fat, no fat, yes. Atkins, all the fat, right? Like yes. we had it all in my house. We it, followed yeah. it all. We had it all. It's so interesting too, because not that you asked me a question, but I'm just sort of, no. you know, going with it because <laughs> we'll roll with all it. of these, all of these fad diets, like that I did, that my parents did, that so many of my clients are stuck in, Mm -hmm. right? And fundamental to it all is eat less, move more. Yes. And it's just not how the body works. It's not, right? Like we don't need a degree to tell us that a hundred calories of M&Ms and a hundred calories of broccoli are going to different things to do different things. You would would think, but the, the male fitness bros- Totally. Are always out there being like, I see them all the time. And I'm a shredding they're phase. making yes, they're always making <laughs> these videos of like 10 calories is 10 calories. And I'm like, no, it's not. Especially if you have insulin resistance, like 10 calories of protein, fat, and carb is a lot different Correct. than 10 calories of like Snickers, you know? Yes, um, exactly. And so it's, it's just not the same. And I am with you. So like my turning point in nutrition was blood sugar balance. When yes. I was like, that is why I'm craving that. everything. Yes. yes. It was like, it was such a game changer because when you can understand why you are wanting it, then I can be like, oh, I'm going to eat this first because I know this is what my body needs and why I'm craving it. And then if I still want the cookie, then like, then we'll reassess. Right. Then I'll have some or I'll yeah. have less or figure it out. And also that cookie is going to impact you differently mm-hmm. to your point of combining foods and blood sugar. The yeah. cookie is going to be different if we have it after, right after a meal with quality nutrition mm-hmm. or part of a cookie after the meal with protein, quality fat, you know, yes. quality carbohydrates. And that it, it's going to be completely different. And I, you know, I'm in the same boat, right? Balancing blood sugar is the key to burning fat or storing fat. You mm-hmm. don't need all of the other things, you know, Just that everybody, you know, exactly. Yeah. I want to, so I want to talk about one of your key points that I know you talk about a lot. Yeah. That's the burning fat as fuel without keto. But before we go there, I want to take a tangent off the side because I want to get your take on this. And I feel like you've probably seen this before, but I have recently come across this trend in my clients where we'll start changing some things around with their food and they start getting anxiety if they get hungry. And I was like, okay, that's not a 
blood sugar issue. So like wh- what what's going on here? And it turns out they've been on so many restrictive diets where it was like you you can't eat if you're hungry or so many foods are off limits that like it was just go hungry. You can't, you can't, you can't eat a food. Like if you're out and about, my clients will be like, sorry, I can't find, you know, what I would like to have, you know, I couldn't find quality meat. And so do I just not eat? I'm like, no, just eat something like find something. Right. But it's perfection over. Function. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And it's like, they have all this stored anxiety and trauma. So then when we do start to try and like use nutrition as fuel, there's still this hang up emotionally on food because they're like, well, when I tried to change my nutrition before I was hungry all the time. So that must be what's yeah. required. <laughs> yes, exactly. Do you see that a lot? I do. And it's part of the work that we do, right. Is to shift that. And it's because we've been so misled mm-hmm. as to what we got to do. And what, you know, what the body needs, right? We're taught, again, going back to the eat less, move more, hunger means we're eating less, Mm -hmm. right? Hunger might mean, right? Hunger might mean we're moving more rather than, you Mm -hmm. know, and not our body needs fuel. And if we don't give our body what it's telling us it needs, it's going to use the fat. It's not really how it works, but it's one of those things where, we have taught ourselves out of paying attention to our body's signals Mm -hmm. in an effort to follow the rules. Oh, yes. And there's a fear around what it would mean to pay attention to that. And I think there's a difference between paying attention to that and letting a fleeting moment you know, or how we're feeling or a mood at the top, right? Dictate our health Mm -hmm. versus a dialogue and a communication between us and our bodies and being on the same team. Like that whole thing is this fighting between you and your body rather than saying, wait, we're on the same team here, Mm -hmm. right? How, what am, what is this trying to tell me? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like, how can you, how can you eat the nourishing food, but also feel satiated? Um, right. We were just so, having the conversation with the holidays coming up because yeah, people so there's feel a, like that. Yeah. So I do an exercise too, where part of it is like, okay, I'm craving, you know, this thing. Well, what else is going on? Right. When was the last time I ate? Am I actually hungry? Am I stomach hungry or am I head hungry? Mm -hmm. Right? Easy tools because that's really difficult sometimes for us to decipher, right? Yeah. Stomach hungry, a bunch of things will sound good. Broccoli might even sound good, right? (laughs) Quality nutrition sounds good when we're stomach hungry. Mm -hmm. Head hungry is often for one particular thing. And, um, will pass, right? So this goes back, not that I condone this, but this goes back to that old thing, almond mom, that we were Mm -hmm. taught of like, we'll drink water, right? The whole drinking water thing, right? Just fill up your stomach. (laughs) Right. It, not really the thing, but there was this idea of if it passes, it's more likely to be head hunger, right? I call it head hunger. That's not really a thing, yeah. but it's the idea of like something else needs to be fed. So when was the last time I ate? Mm-hmm. Does broccoli sound good? If we ate recently and you're not willing to eat something with nutrition, right? If nuts don't sound good, broccoli doesn't sound good, you know, things that you have around, right? An apple doesn't sound good but things that you would eat if you were hungry, right? Mm -hmm. Odds are there's something else. And so the question that I encourage people to ask themselves is to say, where am I not being fed? What am I actually looking for? Am I looking for a break? 
Because we justify taking a break in our day to eat. We do not justify taking a break in our day to just take a mental break. Yeah. Right. Or do I really need some, am I just stressed out and I need to like get something out or, um, am I really frustrated with someone like, right. So part of those questions are like, what else is going on where we're using food to feed a non-stomach hunger? Yeah. And sometimes, and the shifting then is a process. So in the beginning, it might be saying, yep, I am eating my feelings in this moment and I am not changing anything about it, except that I know I am eating my feelings. I'm aware. (laughs) (laughs) That's a win, right? First, Mm -hmm. the awareness is the first piece. And then the next shift might be what we eat when we eat. So we might say, okay, I know I'm fully eating my feelings in this moment. And instead of cookie dough, I'm having some raspberries and I'm going to call it a win. Even though I'm eating when I'm not actually hungry, what I'm having has some nutritional value Mm -hmm. onward. And then in time, we can look at saying, hey, what could we do that would actually be appropriate food for that particular hunger? Appropriate food for stress relief might be fresh air, sunlight, a walk, music, meditation, breathing, right? There's a million other things that we could think of. And if you're at that point where you're ready to sort of shift to the more appropriate fuel for the hunger, grab a post-it, write a handful of things on it that you enjoy, that you're like, this might work for me, right? And if it's music, like put the actual song, right? A very specific little five or six things on a post-it note. And then stick that post-it note one on your computer screen, one maybe on the coffee table if it ends up happening while you watch TV. Or maybe I have one client who put the post-it on top of the pint of ice cream so that in the process, (laughs) she ran into it and it stopped her in her tracks. And she could look at the post-it note and just pick something and close the freezer and go do that thing. Yeah. You know, a lot of times when we crave sugar, What we Mm -hmm. actually need is protein. So if we're craving sugar and, you know, those higher glycemic carbs and we haven't necessarily eaten in a while, we can recognize and say, okay, what I really need here is some protein and I'm going to go eat that. And it'll sound good to you when, you know. Yeah. I, I think so many times people just go, I have horrible willpower. Like Mm -hmm. I, and it's like, you don't have horrible willpower. You probably are setting yourself up with a blood sugar roller coaster. You're probably lacking nutrients, AKA probably like magnesium, which helps stabilize your glucose, you know? And so, yeah. yeah, you're just, you're setting yourself up for failure. And that's where I think, um, education is education is so important because if you understand why, and that goes back to your point of listening to your, listening to your body and like actually going, what is it telling me? Because I, so I made this video on social media, I don't know, a while ago. And it was about, um, if you're waking up at this time of the night, it's very possible that your blood sugar is dropping and your cortisol is waking you up. And so let's kind of rearrange what you're eating for dinner. Um, Maybe you are someone that needs a snack right now before bed for your adrenal health. And let's do that to stabilize your blood sugar. And someone goes, but what about if I do intermittent fasting? And I was like, (laughs) I think that's the issue. (laughs) You know, it's like, instead of going, maybe that's why I'm having this issue. Instead, it was like, no, I need to keep doing intermittent fasting, but I would also like to fix all of the issues that it's causing. I'm like, well, I think IF is the problem here. Well, and it's so interesting too, because I mean, we could do a whole tangent on fasting and, (laughs) you know, a lot of times with cortisol, you know, if you're starting your day with coffee, you are stopping your body from producing that cortisol and giving you the cortisol when it's supposed to and when it needs it. So it tracks then that later in the day or in the middle of the night, mm-hmm. your body is giving you cortisol at the wrong time. Yeah. You and know, there's so I many agree. pieces to it that like, it's usually not just one thing. Yeah. But it like, cause everything is connected, but that 
also means that small shifts make a big impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just like little pieces of the puzzle that you have to put together because I think so many huge ones are like, you don't have the motivation because you're tired all the time. And then you don't have the motivation, you're tired. So you're not making good choices. And so then that cycle continues and now you're cranky and now you're all of the things. So I want to, I want to go back to the willpower thing. And I want to touch on the motivation thing because so first of all, I did a whole deep dive into willpower and it is so intricately, like you were saying, connected to blood sugar. Yeah. And that's sort of the catch 22 of weight management and willpower is Mm -hmm. that we have to have blood sugar to have willpower, but we think we need willpower to not eat, which lowers the blood sugar. Right. But think of willpower as a refillable cup, right? So there are all these things that drink from the cup and a few things that work for us to refill the cup. And the thing that nobody or most people don't realize is that every decision drinks from that cup of willpower. So it's not that you don't have willpower. It's that we're using it in all these other places and then expect to have something left over here without refilling the cup. ladies. Let's talk about our period products because you need to be paying attention to this. You need to be making sure that they're organic and they are fragrance-free because what you put on your skin is absorbed into your body. And you're wearing tampons or pads if either one of those are your choices. And you're wearing them five to seven days every single one of your cycles for 24 hours. That's an extremely long exposure. We already know about fragrance, artificial fragrance, being an endocrine disruptor. Your hormones are these little chemical messengers. They need to be able to talk to each other. They need to be able to communicate. And fragrance, endocrine disruptors are getting in there and messing up that communication. And then on top of that, you need to make sure they're organic because you are literally putting that right next to your vagina, which is very absorbable. And you do not want something that has been sprayed with a ton of pesticides, specifically glyphosate. Okay. We do not want that. Okay. We are trying to heal and balance our hormones. So removing endocrine disruptors is a really big part of that. This is why I choose Garnu and I am so excited to partner with them. Garnu believes that women deserve more from their period products. Period care products should embrace women's innate femininity while empowering girls all over the world. I literally could not be more proud to share them with you because I love partnering with small businesses because I get to know the owner. I get to get into the nitty gritty of behind the scenes and ask all of the questions. And you know, I ask these questions, but it's also right on their website. So you can look at it as well, but they are 100% got certified and they don't use any chlorine bleach dyes. They don't use any fragrance. All of this is extremely important and you should be looking for these in your period care products. On top of that, you get this cute little tampon box delivered to your door versus realizing you are out and having to go to the store, which I know that's probably happened to you at some point and it is not fun. It has happened to me. This way you don't have to worry about it. On top of each subscription will support feminine hygiene training and female entrepreneurship to Nepali women and girls who are vulnerable to trafficking. Garnu is actually derived from the Nepali word for rescue, which is very, very cool. So you guys, this is such an amazing way to support the show. You get non-toxic tampons. They're a cute little box that's delivered to you and you get to support other uh, women at the same time. So it's wins all around. So I'm going to give you the inside scoop really quick on how to get the best bang for your buck. So you want to set up a subscription because you get free shipping. So if you do four boxes every four months, you get free shipping. And you want to stack that with the discount Leah, L-E-A-H. And this way you get 15% off and you get free shipping. So literally wins all around. You guys, it's so simple to just do the four boxes every four months because it's the same amount. You're just saving money. So 
definitely do that. You just go to garnu.com, so G-A-R-N-U-U.com, and use the code Leah. Mm, kind of like decision fatigue. Yes, exactly. Decision fatigue is a big piece of drinking from that willpower cup. But even what are you wearing in the morning? Which mm-hmm. way are you driving to work? <laughs> you know, are, like we're driving yeah. down the street and we see a billboard for something, a choice to not like even a subconscious choice to not buy the thing we see the billboard for or not go to the place that we see as yeah. we pass by it. You know, a lot of times we're using the willpower for the big stuff, Mm -hmm. which is okay. It's really important. It's, you know, picking our battles with our family or, (laughs) you know, yeah, work or all of these things. And then we think we suck as humans or there's some moral failing that we're having trouble choosing a cucumber over a Twix. Mm -hmm. Like it's chemical. It's Mm -hmm. not your fault. You don't suck. It's chemical. Yeah. Well, on top of that, like when on earth did people start giving food a moral code? Like when? Totally. When? Right. I that dieting. Is like, oh, my biggest pet peeve. Like I made hummus one time and I look at hummus as like a little bit of protein, a little bit of protein, a little in bit of protein, most, quality in, fat, delicious fat. In fat. And it does have some carb in it, but I mostly add that to things because I need fat. And someone was like, well, don't you have to count that for carbs, Leah? Like, I mean, it's a good carb, but it's still a carb. And I was like, what? It's a good carb? So I, I like, don't what? count anything. <laughs> no. Like, I don't. If something requires you to do math beyond no, because I'm choosing a packaged food and I want to understand what's in the package, right? But yeah. if, no matter what you eat, you have to do some sort of calculation, like pause. It does yeah. not need to be that difficult. No. And well, then there you go with your decision fatigue again. But it's like, exactly. If you're giving all of these foods, these moral values, then you're feeling like a failure. And then you're like, I'm a bad person because I didn't eat good foods today. (laughs) And it's like, right. Let's, let's look at food more so on how it's nourishing your body. How do you feel after you eat it? Um, and all of those things. And I don't really know totally. how I got onto the moral conduct, but I don't know. <laughs> well, because I feel like we think when we don't have willpower, it's a moral fail. Oh, yes. But then yes. The other thing on the motivation front, like I, we have been sold a bill of goods on motivation. I would love for everyone to throw motivation out the window and think more about momentum. Motivation it's sort of like a chicken and egg, right? Am I doing the things because I'm motivated or am I motivated because I'm doing the things? And I will tell you nine times out of 10, motivation comes after the action. Mm -hmm. We're motivated to do it because we've seen how we feel and we enjoy that, Mm -hmm. right? And so there's momentum in keeping going, but it is very rarely motivation that starts us. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes- when we start, you know, my specialty is weight management, right? Mm-hmm. And so a lot of times people come and they are so unhappy and frustrated and discouraged. And it is that darkness that is motivating them mm-hmm. to have this conversation. And part of the work, just like we were talking about before with other things, part of the work is to shift what motivates us from what we don't want that darkness to what we do want, energy and vitality and feeling good and all of those other things. And that's a process too. And I see it all the time where, you know, we make some progress and then people think they've hit a plateau (laughs) Mm because we've also been told that, you know, what we think is a plateau is not really a plateau, but we think we've hit a plateau. Yeah. And then we go, well, how do I motivate to keep going? I'm getting discouraged or the results aren't as fast as they once were. And it's Mm -hmm. like, well, how do I motivate myself to keep going? Well, what motivated me in the beginning? Oh, I was really unhappy. And this is me, not real science, but I think we try to reclaim the motivation 
by looking at what motivated us when we started and saying, oh, I was unhappy. Well, maybe if I beat myself up enough now, I'll be motivated to keep going. Mm -hmm. And we try to like beat ourselves up into compliance. That's true. And it's an interesting, very counterproductive approach Mm -hmm. that is a piece of this process. So if you're feeling discouraged and you're trying to figure out the motivation, like pause for a hot second, think about what you do want. And then what's one or two things that help you feel that way? And just do the one thing. Schedule it, prioritize it, pick one thing mm-hmm. that helps you feel that way. Yeah, it's it's such a hard journey, I think, when it comes to weight loss because you're so inundated with such harmful, literally harmful information. Yes. And when you finally get around to doing it the right way, um, it's it's like pulling teeth to pull your emotions out of the gutter, literally, because, I mean, I've had clients, <laughs> I've had clients literally with PCOS insulin resistance, and in a few months, they've lost 20 pounds, which is like yep. incredible. And they're like, I'm still getting flack from my family, or I like am not losing it fast enough. And I'm like, I'm not losing it fast enough that's incredible. (laughs) You know, (laughs) like we're just so, we're just so stuck in these people that hop on this diet and they're like, I lost 50 pounds in one month. And I'm like, well, a, that's not safe, but it's also not sustainable. So then guess what? It's also likely water and muscle, not fat. Right. Yes. And I'm just like, don't we want to, instead of just continually hopping on these diets, like let's like figure out how to change a lifestyle that you can, that you can feel good, but it's like pulling teeth. It's literally, and it's, it's so hard emotionally. And I've been there. I was the person that would like Google on Pinterest, like what is the five minute ab workout I can do? Cause you know, I only want to do five minutes or like, what's the like 20 minute, whatever workout or the, the three day like detox plan. Like we've all been there. We've all been there. And that's where I, I really work with people and I encourage everybody have the foundation of science and biology and nutrition and a little bit, right. doesn't, you don't need a degree, right. But a little bit of understanding Mm -hmm. so that when you hear what somebody else is doing, when somebody else, you know, says what they think you should be doing, right. You have a framework, a foundation from which you can then evaluate everything that's coming at you. Mm -hmm. And we can say, how does that jive with what I know to be true? And what would need to exist for that to be true? Right? So we're sort of thinking about it from both sides and then saying, does this make sense given what I know, not just about science and biology, but also what I've learned about my body Mm -hmm. in this process. Mm -hmm. And then we can feel comfortable because we've thought, right? Intellectually, we've processed it. Mm -hmm. And we can say, you know, I love that for you. <laughs> I'm good. Thanks. Yeah. Right. And we can also develop some skills around how we have those conversations or don't have those conversations with yeah. other people and the people that we surround ourselves with. And who do we actually talk about this whole process with? Mm-hmm. You know, when I first started, like when I was in college, I remember I was living in a house with seven other people. I didn't okay. tell any of them what I was doing because. I watch, I watch my plate enough. I don't need you watching my plate. Can you imagine? Oh, no. <laughs> no. Right? Like, I don't need everybody else watching my plate. But it's funny because now, right? Like, I was just home for holidays and it's like, everybody's watching my plate. Like, my dad said something. I had a half a bagel and my dad's like, so bagels are okay? And I was like, yo, bro, what I do over here has nothing to do with what you do over there. <laughs> oh my, we could have a whole whole topic about this because one time I remember my sister-in-law I was eating something she's just you eat carbs and I'm like yes I eat carbs <laughs> and she's I like you but you're carbs. healthy I, I thought like you don't you eat carbs and I'm like carbs are healthy <laughs> it's like you know or people will say like don't judge me while they're eating I'm like oh I'm like I'm, I'm eating not my own police. food over here I don't know what you're doing right 
I'm not the uh, food police. Yeah. And if you didn't ask me, I'm not volunteering. Yeah. I will keep my thoughts and opinions to myself because I'm not in your body and I don't know your story. So, yeah. uh, so speaking of carbs though, because um, we all know, and this is again, with science, we know that you need glucose for your thyroid hormone. We know we need glucose to ovulate. So you need carbs. So can we talk about burning fat as fuel without keto? Cause we hate yes. keto. So it honestly, it goes back to blood sugar, right? And we sort of started here. But so when our blood sugar is too high and when our blood sugar is too low, we are storing fat. So the example of too high that I like to give is sort of like, um, you know, the grocery store checkout, Mm -hmm. right? So you have this like conveyor belt, you have the person who's ringing it up. And back in the day, you had somebody who was bagging everything. Back right? in the day. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like no, there aren't like, I, it's all like self-checkout now, right? It like you're is. a one-man band, right? Yeah. But so, you know, wh- when there was like the cashier and the bagger mm-hmm. and, you know. So when that conveyor belt is going at a nice, even pace, the cashier rings it up. It goes to the person putting stuff in the bags and that person putting things in the bag could put the heavy things on the bottom, right? The cans are under the bread instead Mm -hmm. of the cans squashing the bread or breaking all your eggs or like all the freezer things are together all the, right? When food and fuel come at a nice, even pace, our body produces insulin. Insulin carries all that fuel to our muscles and our cells to be used. Mm-hmm. right? Uses energy. Our muscles and all of our cells can only take in so much fuel at a time and then they close. All of the excess and the excess insulin gets stored as fat mm-hmm. because our fat cells never close. They're, they're real geniuses, right? <laughs> so they don't close. Love that for them. So, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so when we eat too much, when we um, start with the bread basket at the restaurant and mm-hmm. spike our blood sugar, it's like pushing the button, speeding up that conveyor belt. The cashier just starts to do everything as fast as possible. The bagger throws everything in any bag, right? Our body is doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. And we're storing all that excess as fat. In the other extreme, when we go for long periods of time without eating, When we don't eat enough, our blood sugar is too low. And our body in its infinite caveman wisdom thinks it's a time of famine and says, you will not kill me. I will survive. Mm -hmm. And how I survive is to store anything I get for use later on and to burn as little as possible. Mm -hmm. So it's like, that same grocery store conveyor belt, when you put yeah. one thing on it, the conveyor belt doesn't really move, right? Mm-hmm. Or it moves a little bit and then it stops. The bagger does their thing, yeah. right? Cashier, bagger, and it sits in the bag. Yeah. And nothing happens because it's waiting for the next thing. Yeah. So when our blood sugar is too low because we've gone for long periods of time without eating, we're not eating enough. Yeah. Our blood sugar is too low. We're storing fat. The key is to keep our blood sugar in the middle zone where we're never storing fat. How do we keep our blood sugar in the middle zone? We eat regularly. We eat protein, fiber, vegetables and fruit, quality fat. You don't need a CGM, a constant glucose monitor. If you're like a data person, you could, but you don't need it, (laughs) right? Mm -hmm. When, and I always say, you know, weight management isn't magic, it's science. But I do think a couple of things are magical. So one magical piece is when we're consistent, keeping our blood sugar levels stable or, you know, within a range, right? Yeah. Our body will release the fat stores it's been holding onto because we're never adding to them. Yep. And our body is going, wait, it's never a time of famine. I don't need all this that I've been holding onto. I can let it go. And our body will actually release Mm-hmm. And, you know, the other thing that I think is magical is that when we're consistent, keeping our blood sugar in that middle range, we are better equipped to handle the occasional spike 
and the occasional drop, which means we're not going to go the rest of our lives without eating birthday cake. But next year, when Mm -hmm. you go to eat your birthday cake, it doesn't impact you the same way as it might right now. Mm -hmm. It's about rehabbing the metabolism. You do not need to, you know, do keto or intermittent fasting or all these things to get your body to burn fat. Your body will release fat when it knows it can. Yeah. If so, if you're one of the women who goes, I smell a donut and I put on weight, you are, you are the person we're talking about that doesn't eat enough food. And that's why I think all the time when my clients are like, I'm eating so much more Leah, but I'm losing weight. I'm like, yeah, yep. because we are nourishing your body. We're getting your minerals where they're supposed to be. So your body can do what it's supposed to do instead of being like, well, we're nourished today, but tomorrow you're probably going to skip breakfast. So got to well, hold on to dinner. The thing. It's not like we can be like, oh, I went to recess once in second grade. So like, I don't have to move today. Like that's not how it works, right? (laughs) It's all of those pieces. And so it all works together. We do a little bit every day Mm -hmm. and it feels like magic, even though it's really just doing a little bit all the time. And you're exactly right. Like when we feel like we smell the donut and gain weight, there's a lot more going on here. Yeah. And People also like going back to like what everybody obsesses over. Yeah. I get it a lot with quantity of nuts. And I always say to people, like, if we're in a space of needing to count nuts, we're in a really good spot. But right now, if what you're eating are nuts, I don't care. Have a handful because your body can regulate nutrition. Mm-hmm. Your body cannot regulate food like substances and chemicals. Yeah. So, you know, the chips, the pretzels, a lot of these foods are formulated such that it turns off our brain's ability to know when we're full. Mm -hmm. There are hormones, leptin and ghrelin, that tell us when we're satisfied and when we're hungry. So the same way that we can become insulin resistant, we can become resistant to these hormones that tell us when we're done eating. Mm -hmm. So it's all these pieces that rehab the metabolism to function. So if what you're eating is something with nutrition, I promise you the quantity will take care of itself. Your stress over the quantity is doing more harm to the metabolism Mm -hmm. than the food itself. If the food has nutrition. Yeah. Just eat quality food. Don't raise your stress levels. I say to everybody, if you're no taker, write this down. Protein and fiber at every meal makes removing fat no big deal. It rhymes. Right? And protein and fiber at every meal makes removing fat no big deal. Protein is clean, lean protein. I don't care. Animal, plant, whatever. Clean, lean protein. Fiber is vegetables and sometimes fruit for the most part, right? And then the other thing you need a couple times a day is quality fat. And one day I'll figure out how to get the fat part into the rhyming sentence. But for now, (laughs) right? If yeah. that's where we're focused on feeding ourselves, right? If it's those foods first, mm-hmm. the rest will fall into place. Mm-hmm. And I think, and what your amounts are, are completely different, which is why people always like, can you share your, your daily eating? I'm like, no, I will not share my daily eating because what I need and what you need are two different things. And we need Correct. to stop giving away your power of like, I need someone to write me a diet plan. I need someone to write a nutrition plan. It's like, no. How do you feel after you eat? Are you still hungry? Okay, eat some more food. Like, you know, and I think we overcomplicate it. Exactly. Um, I love your rhyme. And blood sugar balance is like, I mean, my mood's improved. Um, I see women's periods improve. Um, I'm not hangry. I don't get tired because you don't have that crash. You sleep better. You're nicer. Well, that's the whole thing. And I am not a mental health professional, but all of the research on mental health connects to neurotransmitters. Yes. Neurotransmitters are a function of nutrition. Yes. Vitamins, minerals, in particular, amino acids, right? We need all of these building blocks for the neurotransmitters and we need sleep and we have to manage Mm -hmm. stress, right? All these things that deplete all of those nutrients too. It's everything is chemical 
even the stuff we think is so mental is still mm-hmm. chemical. And it fundamentally tracks back to our metabolic health. More and more research these days is tracking everything back, almost every disease state to our metabolic health. Mm -hmm. And we're not doomed. I think the best part about that is to understand that like, we have powering that. It's really exciting to think that like, we really can, can like reclaim control of our health and our longevity. Mm -hmm. And every aspect of what's happening. Yeah. And just be consistent. Like stop trying to make like, you know, I'm going to start over on Monday and every meal needs to be perfect. Otherwise I'm failing. It's like, no, next meal, next snack, just consistency. Goodness. Well, this was a mine field of gold nuggets. (laughs) So maybe you go back and take some notes. (laughs) Um, But I'm going to link your podcast, Salad with a Side of Fries, and we'll put your Instagram and all the good stuff so people can come follow you. So thank you so much for hopping on. Well, thank you. I feel like we could talk for hours and hours. So just (laughs) appreciate you having me. Of course. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Balancing Hormones Naturally. If you found this helpful, I would love for you to share it with a friend and post it on your stories and tag Balancing Hormones Naturally podcast so we can get this message out. You can find me on Instagram at Leah underscore B-R-U-E-G and I would absolutely love to hear from you.